Struggling to be what I am. You know, it seems um, like a silly thing to say, and it would be, except that's what um, most of us uh, can do for a long time on um, thinking that we're on the spiritual path, right? Um, if the goal of this spiritual search is to find, discover for ourselves our true essential, let's call it beingness, whatever that may be. Um, if, if that's the, the goal of this movement, this search, um, seems like there's two possibilities. One is that we're already that and we are, are, are our job is really to discover it for ourselves. Or the other possibility is that we're not it and we have to find it somewhere outside of ourselves. Those are the two possibilities, right? But if we, if we are it already, um, what would we have to do to find it? I mean, where would we look? Where would we begin to look? It would seem like any place we searched um, any direction that we looked would take us further away from ourselves. If we're already standing in the middle of the circle, any, any direction, north, south, east, west, any direction that we decided to walk would take us further away from what we already are. So in that sense, um, seeking to find what we already are, um, I mean, how would you even begin to do that? I mean, what, what would that even look like? So it seems like if, if, the, um, if what we are is already what we are, um, the best thing to do would just be to stop, you know, stop searching outward from ourselves and just stop long enough to see what's already here when we're not trying to make something else happen, right? Does that make sense? Does it sort of take our foot off the gas and see what's already present? So the, the, other, the other possibility is to deny what's already present, say, well, it can't possibly be here, not like this, not with, you know, my, you know, checkered past and my faults and my quirks and my inconsistencies and my doubts and all of that. That, that can't be it. It's gotta be something other than what I am, right? So that we, we start off in that direction, denying um, the possibility of it being here in search of it somewhere other than where we are. So we look um, I mean, there's lots of places to look, right? There's, um, you know, we can look in mental activities, you know, philosophies, we can look towards experiences, having a peak experience, having a spiritual experience, um, having, you know, an exciting, adventurous experience, having an intimate experience. I mean, there's lots of possibilities, places to look for the ultimately fulfilling experience, right? But we can also look to our feelings. You know, if I feel good, that must be an indication that I'm getting closer, right? I should feel just better and better. And then one day I'll feel really, really good and um, I'll be blissed out the rest of my life. So this is, this is um, looking at denying the possibility of its presence here uh, in favor of hoping to find it somewhere else. So the, um, you know, over the ages, we've been told from many traditions to look within, right? In different ways, look within, um, you are what you seek. Um, the kingdom of heaven is within, um, et cetera. So we can, I mean, just those few statements right there are coming from um, 
Christianity, Sufism, Buddhism, be a lamp unto yourself, right? All of these are saying essentially the same thing. Look, look within, right? And, um, you know, we, we look within and conclude that, no, that, that can't be it. You know, I know they're saying that, but they, they probably don't really mean it. <laughs> they really mean look within to see how you're lacking and then you'll go out and search for it. Some, some rationale like that. But if we're looking in um, some place where um, awakeness can't be found, how long will we need to look? I mean, a long time, right? There's, uh, I know I've told this story before, but it's, it's appropriate exactly what we're talking about here. So in um, Persian mythology, there's a uh, um, sort of a fool, wise man um, uh, by the name of Mullah Nasruddin. And the story is that, um, you know, one day um, Nasruddin lost his keys and he's down on a sidewalk under a street lamp looking for his keys because he, he knew that he, he lost them. And a friend of his comes along and says, you know, what are you doing? And Nasruddin says, well, I'm looking for my keys. And so this friend gets down on his hands and knees and they're both, you know, sort of searching for the keys under the street light. And about 10, 15 minutes go by and um, his friend said, well, you know, where, where'd you actually drop these keys? And uh, Master Dean said, well, I actually dropped them in the alley over there, but it was dark there and the lights are much better here. So I'm gonna look here. So this is um, a foolish story about looking in a direction that isn't fruitful, right? Looking where something can't be found. So in this case, if what we are looking for is what we essentially are, um, if we deny its presence here and look for it somewhere outside of ourself, um, you know, it's like, you know, being on our hands and knees underneath the street light, you know, we will never find the keys. Yeah. So um, the sense of uh, looking within, um, you know, we, you know, if we decide, oh, okay, maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll try, I've heard meditation works. So I'll um, sit down and try to meditate and look within. And um, one of the first things that I'm sure you've all had the experience of discovering is that when we first look within, it's, there's not um, generally peace and quiet. It's generally much noisier than it, we thought that it would ever be. You know, just the volume, the intensity, the continuity of, of the thought stream is a bit shocking, um, you know, to see that um, level of cacophony that, and, and to discover that we're not actually in control of that at all. But one of the things that we can observe um, fruitfully by it, um, rather than, you know, trying to change the content of the thought, which is what most of us try to do, either change the content or just make it quiet, quiet down. So the problem with that is the more we try to make it quiet down, um, the more energy we of course give it and the louder that it gets, um, the more, the less control that we see that we actually have. Um, but what we can see from it is that even while that thought is happening, there's something else there's something that is noticing the thought. Whatever the thought may be, it might be wonderful thought, spiritual thought, worldly thought, mundane thought, and actually doesn't matter at all. Um, the important thing is to notice that there's something that notices the thought. And we, can, we can call that awareness. We don't actually even have to know what that is or be able to even describe it really, but we can experience it. There's something that is aware of, let's say us having a busy mind. That's useful, that's really useful. So if there's something there that's aware of the thought, whatever that is, is prior to the thought itself. So in that sense, looking at the thought 
is actually no different than, you know, looking at the big house across the street. Right, we're still, we think we're looking inside because we're looking at a thought, but actually we're looking at something that's arising within the field of awareness, right? So if we can really see that clearly, we can see that whatever the thought is, um, it will never be more than the next thing that appears within awareness. So that can't be what we essentially are. Because whatever the thought is, you know, 10 minutes later, an hour later, tomorrow morning, we'll have a different thought. We'll have changed our mind a little bit, maybe a lot. We'll have a like, different philosophy than we had 10 years ago. So there's nothing permanent in the thought. Um, any thought is um, transitory, it comes and goes. We have to remember it back into existence. That's, that's the reality, the only reality that it has. So there's something more primary than that, namely this awareness, right? So then we thought, well, you know, maybe um, if I look to my feelings, that feels more interior, more looking, more like looking within than thought. Um, so we, you know, we explore that, you know, explore our emotions and we can spend a lot of time trying to improve um, our feeling, feeling better, right? Feeling more positive about ourselves, um, you know, raising our energy level so we're, um, you know, feel, feel better, okay? But the, the same mechanism can be seen there. Um, we, you know, to, to try to, improve our mood, improve our um, feelings um, is believing that somehow what I essentially am is rooted in these feelings, um, that that's, that's what I am. That feels closer than thought. But we can see that the same mechanism is at work, that whatever the feeling is, there's something that notices it. Whatever notices it isn't a feeling, something that notices the feeling. So in that sense, thoughts, I mean, feelings are not really, um, you know, fundamentally different than thought. Again, they're just what arises within, you know, our field of awareness, within uh, what we notice. And there's a feeling arise, beautiful, okay? It's not essentially who we are. If we're feeling good one moment, we can't say, well, now I exist. And then the next minute we don't feel you know, quite as elevated and high. We can't therefore conclude now I don't exist. Right? So our core sense of beingness isn't, can't be rooted in feelings. And exactly the same logic can be applied to perceptions, right? Any, any experience, any, anything that we perceive, hear, feel, taste, touch, experience, um, any event, anything is, again, the next arising within this field of consciousness. So we have thinking, feeling, perceiving. That's it. That's, that's the entire way that we experience everything. Those three, thinking, feeling, perceiving, and all three appear within this green of awareness. Okay, so if we are looking uh, to any one of those as uh, the, the source of our beingness, um, source of what we actually fundamentally are, essentially are, um, we can see that there's always something prior to that. This awareness is always prior to that. So if we're looking, for example, for the right enlightenment experience, you know, we hope that it'll be, you know, you know, amazingly blissful, otherworldly, expansive, 
mind altering. But we can see that all of those aspects, all of, all of that arising um, is still with a perception that appears to us. All of that, no matter how blissful, mind blowing that experience may be, it's still an arising within awareness. And what happens when we believe that that's what enlightenment should look like, that, that we, um, uh, we're entranced by that. We love that. You know, we, we've heard that that's what it is. And so in, in the, a moment of self-realization, if it appears that way, and it doesn't have to at all, but if it does appear that way, we can be so entranced with the experience that we take the experience for the realization. And they're not the same. The experience can be whatever it is. It can be mind-blowingly blissful. It can be quite ordinary. It can be as simple as, I never would have guessed that. It's been there all along. I'll be darned. It can be just literally that simple. What's important is the recognition of what is um, truly home base, you could say, where we, where we truly reside um, being this awareness. So whatever that experience is, if we take the experience, even an in, uh, in enlightenment experience as it, that experience is impermanent. That experience, like all experiences will fade over time may feel good for months, maybe even a year or so if you can stretch it out. <laughs> but it, it, will, um, it will evolve, it will um, fade over time. Fade into contentment, fade into peace, right? Okay, so if we, if we believe that um, the experience is what is the essential part, um, when it begins to fade, it can feel like, oh, I've lost it, you know? So if, if that's our belief, then it can feel like, um, you know, well, what, what we've basically done is thrown out the bathwater. No, we've thrown out the baby and we've kept the bathwater. <laughs> that's what we've done, right? So the, the real essence there is um, the recognition of uh, just the sense of awareness. Um, the experience will go, you know, if we think that's what it is, it will feel like it fades and then we'll struggle to try to get that experience back again. Right. We believe that the essence was in that experience however high that might have been, um, it will fade and it will feel like we've lost it and we'll try to struggle to regain that experience. I've got, I had it, I knew it, I lost it. I thought I could never lose it. It was so clear and um, that was 10 years ago. In the meantime, that awareness is still present today, but we've dismissed that, we've ignored that. So one of the um, things that's confusing is that we've all been taught that, um, well, that this search for enlightenment is uh, a difficult search. You know, it's a long journey, it's a hard journey. And um, if we hear that um, what you seek, you already are, um, sort of short circuits <laughs> that, whole, that whole search, right? And we hear that and everybody said, well, that's, that, sounds, that sounds nice. But um, we've also heard that, you know, if something sounds too good to be true, it's probably, probably is. So, you know, we, you know, we question it. We think we somehow um, know how this should work, how this enlightenment journey should, should look. And when we hear that you are already what you seek, that that is already present, 
um, you think, yeah, that sounds good, but um, you know, if you know, I've I've tried, I've put out a lot of energy, and um, you know, there've been some changes, but not um, really any ultimate change. Um, but if I so if I just sit back now, then what will ever change, right? That's the theory. But what we may not have done yet is to really allow everything, literally everything to be as it is. So that means, you know, all our old grievances to allow them to just be acknowledged, um, but ceasing to engage in, I know what's right. I know what should have happened. I know what they should or shouldn't have done. Um, we'd have to let, um, other family members or our neighbors be as they are. It's actually a gift we can give them and a gift we can give ourselves. Um, you know, we'd have to allow everyone that has ever hurt us to have done so. Happened, right? Doesn't mean that we have to like it but it, it does mean that we can acknowledge the fact that that's what happened. So we're not, we're not trying to change anything. We're not trying to deny anything. We're not trying to fix anything. We're just coming to terms with that is what happened. That is what is happening. You know, we can argue with that we can argue with the reality of that, but that argument we will lose. You know, we're arguing with what happened or what is happening now. Um, we will lose. You know, accepting that doesn't disempower us. It actually um, conserves our energy to um, respond to the situation as, as best we can without any expectations or hope for outcome, right? That's what we can do. So the sense of struggling, one of the, one of the reasons for that is that we're seeking, 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 and yet we don't know exactly what we are seeking, right? If what we are seeking is what we already are, and we don't know what we essentially are, how, how are we going about that seeking? Right? We don't know what we essentially are. Who is it that is seeking? Yeah. So um, this, this movement of uh, feeling like, well, I've got to do something. I, I, uh, there's something that I feel like I'm lacking and therefore I need to look somewhere outside of myself to sort of bring it into my domain somehow. So one of the, one of the um, uh, well, I find it interesting anyway, that one of the um, differences, very generally speaking here, um, between Western religions and Eastern religions, let's say, is in Western, re uh, Western religions, there's a sense of um, sort of uh, lack, you know, original sin, lack from the get-go. And somehow we have to make ourselves worthy, you know, plead our case to the divine, um, you know, do good deeds, you know, up our game to the point of being worthy of being um, embraced by uh, the unity of existence, let's say, okay. Eastern religions take quite a different tact there. They, um, the, uh, presumption there is that this awareness that we essentially are um, is already pure, never was other than that. Conditioning, yes. <laughs> Conditioning, you know, clouds it over, adds some debris to how that, um, the purity of that awareness functions through these body minds. So our, our job isn't to raise ourselves out of the mud to be worthy of, um, um, 
being at home in this lifetime. It's really, you know, to discard some of the debris that we've accumulated over the years. It wasn't really us anyway, to just uncover what was essentially us all along, always has been, um, namely this awareness that is um, pure from the get-go. So quite, quite different approaches. Um, end up in the same place, but um, quite different approaches in terms of getting there. So one of the things that we um, struggle with is that when we, when we are told to look within, you know, we look at our thoughts, we look at our feelings. And we realize, well, we're not that, but there doesn't seem to be anything else there. There seems to be this sort of emptiness there. And when, when we're asked to look at, um, you know, beyond thoughts and feelings, um, we'd sort of come up blank. You know, it's like, well, I, I don't know the right answer. You know, I can't, I don't find anything. So one of the difficulties is that we don't trust what we see. We don't trust our actual experience, which is precisely that. You know, precisely looking within, getting, you know, beyond thoughts and feelings and perceptions. And there's nothing else, right? There's, there's like, it's empty, you know, it's like no one home. And we can just conclude, well, that, that can't be right. You know, I was looking for my higher self, you know, my divine self, my enlightened self. And, you know, I, all I come up with is just this blank. So that can't be it. So we distrust our own observation in favor of what we think we know, you know? So this is, you know, in some sense, we struggle against our own knowledge. Um, so this can be called uh, spiritual ignorance. It doesn't have anything to do with intelligence. Um, in fact, people that are um, quite intelligent uh, uh, can be, it, it can work in their disfavor. Because we think we know, if we think we know, then we're not open to whatever our experience is, where we tend to see what we actually experience, um, but we don't see it clearly because we're expecting to see something else. Um, so this, this sense of not trusting what we actually discover for ourselves um, causes us to struggle, you know, because we, we experience one thing, but we're told, no, that's not it. It should look more like bliss and peace and, um, you know, spiritual powers, spiritual experiences, lotus blossoms. So if my, my experience is something other than that, I've gotten it wrong. Okay, there's, there's also our belief that um, in order to um, be awake, that we have to have the right experience. It has to look like this. So we struggle to have a particular experience that we've read about. And if our experience is anything other than that, uh, we question, question our experience in favor of what we believe or what somebody else's experience was. So again, we come back to um, if the search is to discover our essential nature, our essential nature can't sort of come and go and be there one moment and not be there the next. It, 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 we, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it through a, a lapse of our essential beingness being absent. You know, so there has to be, um, there has to be a, a continuity there of what we essentially are, right? We couldn't just drop into non-existence and then through some good fortune or um, come back into an ex existence at some later point. That whatever we essentially are um, is what we are, like always, like even in this particular moment. 
So the idea of having the right experience, you know, from this perspective, um, doesn't make any sense at all. But if that's what we're trying to do, if that's our proof to ourselves that um, we've had awakened experience, then um, we doubt ourselves in favor of some idea. And that, that dissonance uh, causes suffering because we, you know, we can't trust what we actually are experiencing um, in favor of some mental concept. Another thing that causes us to suffer is, is trying to do two opposing things at the same time, right? So this is like, you know, trying to open and close a door at the same time. You know, in the case of spirituality, um, what we tend to do is um, uh, desire to be free of um, the sense of self-limitations, um, wanting to let go, you know, become what we know we are that's bigger than what we feel like we are in this moment, that movement. So that's one movement. And the other movement is um, fear of letting go, fear of what we might discover, what we may, what may happen if we actually did let go. If I want to let go, I know it's the right thing to do, but if I do, I don't know what I'll find and it could be the end of me. All right. Anybody ever feel that? So there's this movement and then there's this er, not now, you know. So we, we can sort of move in this direction and we get too close and say, oh, no, I'm gonna back up a little bit here. So this is two, two opposing forces, um, desire and fear, basically. Desire of, um, uh, that's really rooted in a, a deep yearning of something that we, for our own happiness, for our own well being, and fear of what um, that might look like. It might mean the end of me personally, my personal independence. You know, I want to be one with everybody, but I want to maintain my own personal independence, right? There's two movements here, two opposing movements, lots of effort no movement, right? Okay. Another um, issue has to do with honesty. So um, by honesty in this sense, I just mean uh, our willingness to really look at um, our stories, basically our storylines about how things should be or what I am or what I should be, um, what happened in the past. Um, and to just, just see it clearly. This doesn't mean, you know, just getting down on ourselves. That's not helpful any, that's just taking the opposite tact, right? So, it, but it's just seeing clearly what, what happened. And um, um, there's an interesting phrase I came across this week. This is from uh, Dr. David Hawkins, that, who's no longer with us, but, um, um, his phrase was, um, you know, something that we did in the past that, you know, wasn't quite um, up to our expectations of what we should be. Um, he, he called uh, the appropriate thing is to have a, a, a decent regret, right? It's not, it's not like a immovable sin or anything, but it's just having a decent regret. Yeah. I, I messed up, I, I, I didn't act in accordance with what I knew to be true at the time. You know, it's how we learn, right? So this is, this is just being honest. Um, there's a really cute but um, worthwhile story. It's actually a, a children's book, but the origin of the story is a, a Chinese folk tale and um, the this, this story is called an empty pot, the empty pot. And the story is that the um, aging emperor was looking for a successor. And uh, he still had a you know, few years to go. So he was looking for some, um, you know, probably young teenagers maybe um, that he could sort of bring along and, and uh, 
bringing to the fold that could be his successor. And so what he announced in his little kingdom is that uh, he asked you know, all the you know, children who were interested of that age to come and um, uh, he was going to give them each a seed and that um, they should take it home and plant that, that seed that he gave each of them in a pot. Um, and then exactly a year later, they should all come back and um, whoever had the best plant would, would be a successor, right? So what he didn't tell the um, children, uh, there may be, I don't know, 20 of them, but he didn't tell the children is that he boiled all the seeds before he gave, gave them out. So they were all dead, right? Dead seeds. And so these um, kids, you know, went home and hopefully planted the seeds in the pot. And of course, none of them grew, right? Um, but then a year from then, everybody thought, well, you know, this is embarrassing. My plant didn't grow at all, but I really want this. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll just get another seed and plant it and grow a really nice plant and bring it and the emperor will be impressed. And so all, all of the children did that, except one um, who um, just brought their empty pot. That's what they had to show. And of course, that, that was the child that the emperor picked, the one honest child out of twenty. But it wasn't, the, the instructive thing here is that it wasn't what they expected, right? It, it, it wasn't the outcome um, that was expected. So it's like the empty pot is what happened. And that's the, the reality of that is what they actually um, had the honesty to bring. Okay. So when we're looking um, at um, things that sort of grab our attention and, and pull us into contraction, um, it's important to recognize how we're, how we're looking at that. Are we looking at it just as an observer to see what actually happened? Um, or are we looking at it more like a PR manager or spin doctor, you know, trying to tweak the story enough in our, our favor, of course, um, to, to feel better about it, you know, to feel like, oh, okay, I was, I was actually right all along. You know, so, um, you know, this, this expenditure of energy to try to improve our, our story rather than just see the mechanism of um, the beliefs around the story um, and consume a great deal of energy. The sense of it is struggling, struggling to overcome our story um, when the point, whole point is to see the nature of the story and see that whatever happened, happened, not to argue with the reality of it, learn from it and move on. Okay, another um, way we can struggle is um, by being greedy. And one of the ways that we can be greeting, greedy is to um, desire enlightenment, which is a natural thing to do. It sounds so good, why not? Right? But it, the question here is for whom? Who, who, who are we doing that for? That movement to sort of grasp enlightenment and bring it into our into our field. Get it at the market and bring it home. You know what what is that movement? Um, if the if the movement is to you know, is tied up into the enhancement of the personal self, you know, not, not all that much different than desiring, well, anything. I, I know I've used this phrase before, but it's a powerful phrase. This is um, Nisargadatta um, said in this regard that um, a man's uh, desire for a woman is innocence itself. Um, compared uh, to the lust for everlasting bliss, right? Everlasting bliss for whom? Right? For me, personal self enhancement, I'll feel better. Right? 
So that's, that's the movement, that's the grasping. Um, you know, if we can really see that movement and see that um, it is a movement away from what we are, it's a movement from uh, out from what we essentially are. It's a denial of what we essentially are. This isn't enough, but if I get enlightened now, I'll be special somehow. Yeah. So it's a denial of the essence that we already are as if that is somehow insufficient um, in hopes of enhancing ourselves through some attainment. Right. Now, the way to suffer is um, that we talked a little bit about earlier is um, wanting things to be different than they are. Right? Any argument with reality, any argument with ourself, any argument with the thoughts that are raging in our head or the feelings that we might experience or whatever other emotion, regret, guilt, hope, fear, anything. Um, if there's an identification with the object, we will suffer. Okay. One, of the, one of the things that makes um, this spiritual journey really difficult is that um, what we seek is hidden in the last place that we would ever think to look, um, which is the most obvious place, right? the most ordinary place. No, it can't be there. You know, it's got to be some special place, some higher level, all right, some ascendant level. That's where it is. I know that. Not here, not in the ordinary, not in the everyday. Couldn't be that, right? But again, we're talking about a denial of whatever's present here in hopes of attaining something that will be obtained somewhere in the future, of course, but somewhere outside of ourselves uh, through grace, through effort. So hidden in the ordinary, right? Last place we'd ever think to look. Not, not what's actually looking out of my eyes. No, that can't be it. Can't be that immediate. Can't be that simple. Gotta be something really special. I mean, it is special, but it's special um, and ordinary both. Ordinary in the sense that it already exists as is for everybody at this very moment. We don't recognize it because um, it, it's, it, it's, it's so immediate and so obvious that we never give it any value. We give value to the objects the thoughts, the feelings, the perceptions, the events, that we give value to. That which notices it, not so much, hardly at all, mostly never. We ignore that, throw out the baby. Can't actually throw out the baby because it's what we are, but it can feel like, you know, we're always reaching without ever quite attaining. Okay, so what, what is actually present? Uh, that which we already seek is already here. It's already what is looking out of your eyes. So it's not what the eyes can see, right? It's that w which allows that which notices what the eyes see, what is aware of what the eyes see. So it's not what the ear hears, it's what notices what the ear hears. 
It's not what we touch, but it's what we, that which notices what we touch. We have that capability, right? It's not thinking any particular thought. It's noticing that which allows us to recognize any thought, right? So it's not a particular thought. It's not a particular experience. It's that which notices all of that. So that which notices all of that is without form, right? Formless. This awareness is without form. It doesn't have a specific size or dimension. It's not limited by our skin. It's just aware. Right? So the only thing that could encompass form, all of form, is something formless. It's only silence that has the capacity to encompass sound, noise, music, speech, all happening within silence. You know, it's only the um, spacious nature of awareness that allows whatever thoughts to arise, whatever feelings to arise without judgment. Mm -hmm. This allows that to be whatever, whatever that is, whatever our current sensation is. It's only that spaciousness of awareness that can allow all of that to be without itself being tainted by, by any of it. And what's only the um, unmovable nature of awareness, the steadfastness of it, It allows movement to happen within, right? Allows impermanence. Something that's immovable can allow everything that exists is impermanent, allows it to, to be, to come and go. You know, so it's just this already present nature of awareness that has that kind of um, spaciousness, non judgmental quality to it, um, acceptance, silence, peace. So, none of those we've had to conjure up. We just have to step back into um, that, spend some time there and allow it to more and more fully reveal itself what it is. It's already, it's already fully present. It's just really um, our appreciation of it, our gratitude for it, our enjoyment of it, um, that allows it to be seen more and more clearly, to allow it um, to function with as little interference as possible, right? To just be, right? To be. And then we can express how that, that moves in the world. That, that's the possibility. That's the possibility in this lifetime. To get there, we have to give up the struggle, right? Not be opposed to the struggle, but just see that um, any struggle to be something um, other than what we already are, or to obtain something outside of ourself, whether it be a philosophy or a feeling 
or an adventure or perception, all of that is a movement away from what we essentially are. All of those things are fine. It's just not what we essentially are. When we recognize what we essentially are, then all of those things move just um, as they are, freely. Really.